Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Thrive in China roundtable. Um, this is our weekly roundtable where we explore different corporate administrative topics that are affecting foreign investors in China, where they have trouble understanding concepts or um, didn't even know these things existed. Um, so before we get cracking on today's roundtable, again, it's just very interesting for us here at Woodburn to know more about our audience and the participants that are in the Thrive in China community. We would love to have your feedback. Are you a newbie to China? Are you a startup in China? Are you an experienced China hand? Give us a little bit of background in terms of who you are um, and what you do. This always helps us to tailor make our presentations a little bit more. A little bit about myself. My name is Christina Kohler Colucci. I'm the head of business advisory here at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. Um, I've got over 18 years of corporate services and corporate administration experience, specifically in China. Our business is headquartered in Hong Kong, where we offer similar services as we do in China. We've helped over 600 companies, international companies, with their market entry strategies their implementation, as well as their growth in the Chinese market. Um, I've also created a whole series of administrative processes, if you will, um, as China has opened up more freely and made things a lot easier from a bureaucratic perspective that may help foreign investors understand more, particularly in their market entry stage, in terms of creating solid foundations. If you are interested in looking at these processes, head on over to our website, um, you will be able to download those recordings and that information directly. And if you haven't received a copy, uh, we are offering everybody in the roundtable a free copy of our ebook, The 10 Biggest Mistakes Companies Make in China. Um, email me at christina at woodburnglobal.com if you would like to get your own copy of this. So let us get cracking on today's roundtable. This is roundtable number 11 for 2023. And the topic for today is what is Fa Piao accounting? Now, in order for you, in order for me to explain to you what is Fa Piao accounting, I need to give you a bit of um, a lesson, if you will, on value added tax in China, because Fa Piao's and value added tax are meshed together. Um, so let me give you a little bit of insight into value added tax. Value added tax, like anywhere else in the world, is a sales tax. In China, it is a major source of tax revenue for the Chinese government. And as a consequence, there are very rigid rules and systems to tackle any form of VAT, value added tax avoidance. Um, the rules, I have to say, are extremely old fashioned. And again, that's the whole point of this lesson to then explain Papiao accounting to you guys um, of, of what, why it, all of this is happening, okay? So VAT in China is defined uh, into two categories. There is a general VAT taxpayer and there is a small scale taxpayer, okay? Now, very simply, if a company in China applies for the general VAT taxpayer status, the company has the ability to reclaim or offset the VAT on the purchase of goods and services. On top of that, general VAT taxpayers pay their VAT monthly. If a company decides not to apply for the general VAT taxpayer status, then they are considered as a small scale VAT taxpayer and they cannot claim or offset the VAT on purchases from the sales of goods and, and, and modern services, okay? So they cannot reclaim the VAT on purchases. And a small scale taxpayer declares VAT on a quarterly basis, all right? So let's go into a little bit of detail in terms of these two categories. In China, a small scale taxpayer has a normal rate of 3% VAT. If you include the surtax, it's gonna be at three and a half percent. In 2023, we have an exception. Um, the exception is that if you're a small scale taxpayer, the VAT rate is at 1%, which if you include the surtax is about 1.5%. Now, when you are a small scale 
taxpayer who is selling goods or services, you can actually only issue VAT general invoices. Again, these invoices, once issued, cannot be used for deduction by your customer. Only if the customer has a request that you, as a small-scale taxpayer, issue to them a special VAT invoice can the customer then deduct that VAT from their own future sales, okay? Now, special VAT invoices for small-scale taxpayers can only be purchased at the tax bureau, uh, purchased and applied for at the tax bureau. And the request from the customers has to be also shown that the customers are requesting these types of special VAT invoices. Now, to give you an example, at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors, we are an advisory firm. For us, um, for about a good six, seven years, it was it made optimal sense for us to remain as a small-scale taxpayer. But as most of our clients, 90% of our clients are general VAT taxpayers, we did issue special VAT invoices to our customers so they could make that VAT deduction in their own books. So all of this is feasible. It's just a matter of communicating with your tax officer. Now, again, I wanna reiterate, small-scale taxpayers cannot deduct the input VAT on purchases and can only use the costs of purchases to deduct the income tax payable, which is the profits tax payable. The VAT threshold for small businesses and sole traders in China has increased from 30,000 to 100,000 renminbi of sales a month, which means that, as I mentioned this year, I'll go back to the slide. As I mentioned, the 2023 applicable rate is 1.5% with the surtax. If, however, you are generating revenue of 100,000 per month, or 300,000 per quarter, because VAT for small scale taxpayers is paid quarterly, you will be tax exempt. You will be VAT tax exempt, okay? Um, so let me reiterate that. 2023, the rate is one and a half percent, including surtax, but if your revenue per month is less than 100,000 renminbi, and for the quarter amounts to less than 300,000 renminbi, then you will be paying, you'll be exempt from paying any form of VAT as a small-scale taxpayer, okay? Now, that's small-scale taxpayers. General VAT taxpayers basically are buying and selling, whether it's services or goods. Their VAT payable on a monthly basis is the output VAT on sales that's recorded in the VAT software system minus the input VAT that is on purchases, okay? So it's the VAT on sales minus the VAT on purchases. And basically there is a VAT software system that tracks all of your VAT on purchases with your VAT on sales. And that amounts to then the VAT payable on a monthly basis. A general VAT taxpayer when they are selling goods or services, can immediately issue VAT special invoices. These VAT special invoices is what your customers can utilize to deduct the VAT, because for your customer, they're purchasing something from you. They can deduct that VAT from their own sales, and they've got 180 days to do that deduction, okay? Um, so yeah, I just wanna highlight that automatically you're gonna be issuing the VAT special invoices. Now, as a general VAT taxpayer, the rates are dependent upon what you are selling, um, whether it is a good, a service, et cetera. So here I've provided the rates, which are the most current rates. Um, the ones that probably will be most but particular to those of you is sale of goods, generic goods is 13%. Um, the sale of so business supporting services is at 6%. Um, trans logistic services is also at 
So keep, keep that all in mind, okay? Um, it may vary. So it's either six, nine, or 13%. Basically, there are these three rates if you're a general VAT taxpayer. Now, when you are getting your VAT status, um, you actually have different types of FAPIAOs, which I've already mentioned, but I'm going to summarize it here for you. So when you are a general VAT taxpayer, you're automatically going to be able to issue special VAT FAPIAOs. This is used for tax deduction purposes. Even when you are a small scale taxpayer, you can apply to the tax bureau to be able to issue these to your customers who wanna be able to deduct the VAT. If you are a small scale taxpayer and you are just wanting to issue a FAPIAO, uh, then it's just general VAT FAPIAO, okay? Now, why are all these FAPIAOs so important, right? Um, in the Western world, we just prepare a uh, performer invoice, invoice, debit note, credit note in an Excel format, Word format, and we PDF it, right? Or we use our accounting software system to create all of this. FAPIAOs are unique to China. And the last sentence here in terms of the FAPIAO liability is what ultimately affects your FAPIAO accounting. If a company in China fails to produce a FAPIAO when requested by a customer. This constitutes an illegal act. All business transactions are required by law to be recorded on a FAPIAO, okay? Invoices mean nothing. Debit notes mean nothing. Performa invoices mean nothing, okay? So it is really important for you to understand that when you are doing domestic trade, it is all associated with FAPIAOs, these official invoices that are issued. If you have a, 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 a supplier who does not issue you a FAPIAO, uh, then it is considered an illegal act. And if they don't give it to you, you can report them, okay? Now, for you all to visualize what a FAPIAO is. So this is a, a copy of a special VAT invoice. And as you can see here, you have the buyer information, you have the seller information, and you have the invoice seal, okay? The invoice seal is something you will get when your company is established that you have to put on. Now, this special VAT invoice, if you are providing a good or a service, your Chinese company name will go into the seller information, which is at the bottom where it says seller information. Your customer's information will go at the top, okay? Now, I need to explain to you, now that you've visualized it, I need, you, need to explain to you how this all works in terms of special VAT invoices. When you are incorporating your entity in China, you are going to be going to your tax bureau and you're going to be telling them either you want to stay as a small scale VAT taxpayer or you want to become a general VAT taxpayer. My suggestion is to do a type of simulation to understand what is the better option for you, because again, we want to optimize our VAT tax situation. When you indicate to them that you wanna choose one of these categories, you will then, well, if you're a general VAT taxpayer, you will then be able to purchase a VAT booklet, which has approximately 25 to 50 sheets of what you are seeing on today's screen. So this is a booklet that you buy from the tax bureau. It doesn't cost a lot of money. I think the booklet itself is maybe 10 RMB, something like this. And in it, you will have between 25 and 50 sheets looking like this. Now, each sheet has three sheets attached to it. One is white, one is blue, and one is pink, okay? One goes to the buyer, one goes to the seller, one goes to the tax bureau, okay? Um, and the issue is, is that on each sheet, there is a value. So each sheet has a value corresponding to it. 
When you start your business in China, each sheet will correspond to maximum 10,000 renminbi. In the example that you are seeing here today, this sheet's total value is 59 renminbi 60 cents. Okay? Um, that's the value. Okay, and this is a relatively old example because you've got the 17% VAT rate, which was back um, back in the days, but the, the sheet itself hasn't changed um, in terms of appearance. So if you've got a transaction with a customer of 11,500, you will actually be issuing two sheets, one worth 9,999 renminbi and one worth 1,501 uh, 1, renminbi, okay? You'll have to issue two sheets because there's a maximum value per sheet. And again, these are the official invoices that you are then providing to the customer for the sale of that good or that service, okay? Now in China, if you tell your tax bureau, I don't need to become a general VAT taxpayer right now, I'm gonna stay as a small scale taxpayer, there are going to be certain triggers that will force you to become a general VAT taxpayer. And the trigger, the main trigger, is whether in a fiscal year, your revenue hits 5 million B or more. The tax bureau will call you and say, you've got to upgrade your status now, you're a general VAT taxpayer. So you're forced into that situation, it is a trigger, okay? It could also be, that if you've got three or more consecutive months of around half a million renminbi or more in revenue, your tax officer might also say, that might also be a trigger where they say middle of the fiscal year, you have to upgrade your status to a general VAT taxpayer, okay? Um, and then you're not forced. Now, why I'm telling people to create a simulation when they've set up their company is because once you are a general VAT taxpayer, you cannot downgrade yourself back to becoming a small scale taxpayer, okay? You, once you're a general VAT taxpayer, that is for the rest of the life of your entity, okay? However, if you're a small scale taxpayer, you continue that until you hit the triggers or you've got certain transactions that are telling you you've got to now become a general VAT taxpayer, all right? Now, there is a whole spiel going on about e-fa piaos. So I do want to mention it today because it also affects the fa piao accounting. Now, in China, like I said, you've got the paper fa piao system, which has been in place for decades, okay? But in recent years, due to the high frequency of retail, food and beverage, and travel uh, uh, transactions, the Chinese government has started implementing e piaos which is an electronic form, not paper form, okay? Now, the e piaos have the same value. There is the same issue where um, there are two different types of e piaos um, and the appearance is actually identical. An e piao is a data file whereas the paper FAPIAO is an actual piece of paper, okay? In terms of um, financial accounting, the concepts stay the same. So whether it's a paper FAPIAO or an e-FAPIAO, it's identical, okay? Now, the scanned copy of a paper FAPIAO just mirrors the information of the paper FAPIAO and doesn't contain any uh, anti-counterfeiting measures, et cetera. When you have an e piao, there is also again the concept of the general VAT e piao and the special VAT e piao. Um, and you have to print it out uh, with a special printer that is purchased by the tax bureau in order to be able for it to come out when you're doing your trend vouchering system in your accounting that it comes out the same as the paper piao. Okay. Now, before I continue on with, with the EFAP house, I just wanna highlight that you don't have an option to choose whether you wanna do paper FAP house or EFAP house. The rule of thumb is, is that you will get a quota where you can purchase a booklet of the original paper FAP house. Like I said, it's around 25 to 50 sheets. 
And then you will get a quantity of EFA piaos that you are allowed to issue. So in a month, you will be able to issue both if you've got high quantity of transactions. But the rule of thumb is you got to use the paper fa piaos first before you can go on to the e fa piaos. Okay. Now, how can you purchase fa piaos? I, I just highlighted this through this earlier, but I know it's it is a, a very old fashioned and mind boggling process. But let me reiterate what I said earlier. If you are a general VAT taxpayer, you have to buy the VAT FAPIAOs from the Tax Bureau and you will get a booklet of between 25 and 50 sheets with each sheet worth up to a maximum of 10,000 RMB. You can apply for an increase to the quantity of FAPIAO sheets or you use your quota of the eFAPIAO sheets. Okay. When you um, have a certain um, amount when you uh, let me how how to let me properly rephrase this when you've got a consecutive period of three or more months where you are generating revenue of 300,000 RMB or more you may be able to move up a category where your booklet will have a hundred thousand RMB of a value per sheet okay so it's not that you're going to stay forever in the category of 10,000 RMB per sheet you're, it's really your tax officer who will decide when you have the ability to increase to a booklet where each sheet value hits 100,000 RMB. Now, if you have a special transaction, let's say you know that you're going to have a sale of 1.5 million RMB to a distributor, you can make a one-time one application with your tax officer that you have the ability with the contract and the performer invoice to highlight it's a transaction of one point or it's a contract of 1.5 million to be uh, issued within the next six months. Um, they will be able to provide you with the booklet of 100,000 RMB per sheet immediately. Okay. Now, every tax bureau, which is the tax bureaus in your district of where your registered office address is, will have specific nuances on how they define all of this. I've made this very generic for you today, but it is extremely important that if you're going through this process right now, that you have a conversation with your tax officer to know what the rules and obligations are, okay? Now, I just wanna highlight for those of you that have high levels of e-commerce, retail, or even trade business, you've got to use up your FAP sheet paper FAPIAOs first before you can move on to the quota for the e -FAPIAOs. Okay. Now, I'm getting on the subject of today, which is what is FAPIAO accounting, but I need to explain now this point, which is exactly what is going to now boggle your mind even further in terms of what is, a FAP, what is FAPIAO accounting. The question is how to issue a FAPIAO to a Chinese customer. You have two options with this. You can issue the FAPIAO immediately to your Chinese customer, which means that You've got a deal, contract to sign, you issue the VAT FAPIAO, special VAT FAPIAO to them. Um, the minute that you issue this special VAT FAPIAO, that output VAT, meaning the VAT applicable on that FAPIAO, will be already in the VAT software system, affecting the VAT payable in that month which means that if your Chinese customer does not pay you on time, you will be paying out of pocket on that VAT payable, okay? And in your startup phase, this is critical because it could cause an imbalance of cash flow, particularly if you're high transactional right from the beginning, all right? In your startup phase, it might be a better solution for you if you negotiate with your Chinese customer that you first issue a performer invoice, you wait on payment, which means there's no impact on your VAT payable in that month. And as soon as payment is received, you issue the FAPIAO, the VAT special, uh, the special VAT FAPIAO to your customer. And knowing that you've already received the payment, you're not paying out of pocket on the VAT payable in that month. And you're just waiting for it to be paid. 
This frees up your cash flow, allows you to control your cash flow a little bit better while you're waiting for payment from the customer. Now, there's no right or wrong here. It really also then comes down to how you want to do your accounting. Okay. Now, how does all of this affect and impact your Chinese accounting system? I have nicknamed it Fa Piao Accounting, but obviously there is a gap system in China. In China, a Chinese company needs to abide by the Chinese accounting standard regulations. <clears throat> and ultimately, <laughs> um, and ultimately, the Chinese accounting standard regulations follow what I call, and it's to simplify people's mind, a Fa Piao accounting system, meaning that revenue cannot be recorded in your Chinese accounting standard books unless the Fa Piao has been issued. If you issue a performer invoice first, the performer invoice is not what can be included in your revenue. It's only on the date of when the Fa Piao has been issued. And same for when you've got your costs of goods or services or your general administrative expenses, you are reliant on receiving Fa Piaos from your suppliers, right? Your third party providers. You can only record those expenses when you have on from, you can only record them in the month of when those Fa Piaos have been issued to you. So the whole concept of generating an accrual accounting system in China is very difficult because you're dependent on issuing the Fa Piaos to your customers and you're dependent on receiving the Fa Piaos from your suppliers and third parties. It becomes a true issue with timing. Okay. And how you then want to do your invoicing system. Now, you might say to me, well, Christina, I mean, it just makes sense then that we issue the Fa Piao straight away, right? And record it straight away because that's the moment of time when the project is being initiated. That's all well and good, but can you rely on when your customers are going to pay you? And the reason why I say this is because we are first, I'm going to go back in the slides, we're going to be issuing paper invoices to your customers, to cancel, to update and change a paper Fa Piao or even an e Fa Piao is extremely complex. And by complex, I mean bureaucratic, okay? So it's, it's not like you've got a performer invoice that you've generated in Excel and now you suddenly after two months, your customer comes back to you and says, I want a discount that you can update it and send it out again. No, you have to go to the tax bureau and say, actually, I've recorded this FAPIO. I now need to cancel it because I have to change the values because my customer wants a discount. And there's no option to issue a credit note here, guys. Okay, because it's all going to affect your, 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 your accounting. So let me go back. Again, it comes down to how you're going to issue your FAPIAOs and the timing of the issuance of those FAPIAOs and how you are then going to record them in the Chinese accounting standard system that you have to have, okay? Um, the same issue applies with suppliers and with third parties that you're contracting out to. You may find that you work with a logistics company and we have this, this current issue with a client um, they're working with a logistics company that only issues the Fa Piaos three months after the service has actually been completed. Now, in reality, you would put that value and accrue it three months prior, right? And then you will amend it three months later once you've issued the Fa Piao. But you can't even do that in the Chinese accounting standard system. You can only record it once you've received the Fa Piao. So I, I don't like calling the Chinese accounting standard system a cash-based system because it doesn't necessarily have to be cash-based. It depends on when you're issuing the FAPIAO. You might not have received the cash yet, or you might not have actually paid the cash out when you um, receive a FAPIAO from, from, a, from a supplier or a third party. 
So it makes the accounting system very, very complicated. And that's why it also makes it really difficult to read, understand, and have true clarity over the business when you're reliant on the, re the issuance and the receipt of FAPIALS, because it's all based on the timing, not on when the actual service is being delivered or when the actual sale is being, is being completed. Now, let me go back to a recommendation. A recommendation that we have is to have two systems in place, which again is double entry bookkeeping. I'm fully aware of that, but it allows you to do things according to Chinese accounting standards and having a FAPIAO accounting system where you record based on FAPIAOs received, FAPIAOs issued. And then you've got a second system, which is the accrual accounting system, where you're recording your performer invoices, your debit notes, your credit notes, et cetera, based on when things are actually happening, giving you then the true clarity of what is happening in the business today. Okay. Um, this is not optimal by any means, but there is no other choice. Now, the reason why I say there's no other choice is that there's gonna be no other choice as you are starting up your business. The reason why I say this is that if you decide on your own initiative to follow an accrual accounting system, which you can, okay, um, you, you can record then your performer invoices and then you adjust once you've received the actual FAPIAs or issued the FAPIAs, et cetera. One, you may come into issues when you're doing your VAT payable on a monthly basis where the tax officer says, uh, actually, your VAT payable does not match whatsoever your financial management records, your P&L. How are you making these calculations? Nothing. There is no uh, uh, consolidation aspect here. Um, how is it synced? And then you can get in trouble for that. And the second is when you have the year end audit, the auditor may reverse all of your uh, accrued transactions uh, to fit then with the Chinese accounting standard systems, meaning they may have to redo your books, which just might cost you more by the year end. Now, this is for the startup phase. Obviously, if your business is growing to a certain level and a certain size, and I'm talking about tens of millions of RMB in revenue, you have the ability to start doing accruals. Um, and this is where your tax officer will understand. But it is really, really important to make sure that you have your accrual system, you still have your proper VAT payable that's according to FAPIAS issued, FAPIAS received, um, and you have the ability to inform your tax officer uh, where the adjustments have to be made. So you are kind of still keeping two sets of books. Okay, just need to be aware. Now, it is really, really important to create a compliance and management system within your organization in relation to FAPIAOs. FAPIAOs are like gold in China, okay? There is a black market for them, which is why every company needs to have a compliance and management system in place. Now, on one level, the Chinese tax bureaus have made cancellation of special VAT invoices easier, but not really by much. It's still an extremely bureaucratic step, um, especially if you're issuing 10 sheets to one customer and you have to cancel all 10 of those sheets. It, it's still extremely bureaucratic, okay? Um, it, it's a laborious and tedious exercise. It can be done, it's just laborious and te tedious. They have also used a new tax classification coding for goods and services, making it much easier to fill in the data when you're trying to issue the FAPIAOs. And obviously, e-FAPIAOs um, are also making life a lot easier. I don't find it a lot easier because you still have to finish the quota of the paper FAPIAOs to then be able to use the e-FAPIAOs. There is a rumor that within this year and early next year, we will be solely looking at uh, the whole of China being on an e FAPIAO basis. Um, I just, I, I don't know how they're gonna manage that for all of China, where we will have to see that step-by-step. Step. Um, and I do know that in Shanghai, in Beijing, 
Shenzhen, Guangzhou, really still in the bigger cities, Hangzhou as well, it's paper fa piao quota first, and then e fa piaos can be utilized. They have not switched fully to the e fa piao system. Now, the downside um, with the whole compliance and management system and why it's so important for you to set something up is the fact that um, invoices and fa piaos, in, I want to use the word fa piaos, fa piaos in China will be considered void if you make any spelling mistakes or any human error mistakes when you are issuing fa piaos. You will be penalized and those fa piaos will actually be considered void. So let me go back to that page so I can explain what I'm trying to say. This is what a fa piao looks like. Um, e fa piaos look also like this. If you make a spelling mistake on the buyer information, a spelling mistake on the seller information, or you get the numbers wrong, um, you know, in terms of account number, um, values, et cetera, uh, and you want to just simply correct it, Actually, there is no correction method. You have to actually cancel the invoice because it will be considered as void, okay? Human errors happen, okay? People rush, make mistakes. Our recommendation in this regard is always speak to your customer's finance team before you are issuing an invoice um, to get this information in an Excel document that you save it and it then you just have to input it into the system, into the VAT software system once and it's there. The same when you're working with suppliers or other third parties who want to invoice you, give them, prepare an Excel sheet with all of your information that you can send it off to them that there are no spelling mistakes and they are basically just copying, copy and pasting, okay? Um, helps to eliminate um, a lot of the human error. So um, that's one thing. Then the other thing is the frequency of tax audits for VAT invoice compliance. Now we have this situation currently with one client. Um, they have a new tax officer that was appointed to them and they have decided this new tax officer to do a complete audit on all FAPIAOs that have been issued and received by the company. Um, basically they've been chosen out of a hat and they've been asked to go through this type of tax audit. Um, in this process, they did find that one Fa Piao that was issued by a supplier in 2020 uh, was void because of spelling mistakes. But mind you, nobody in 2020 noticed that, neither the tax bureau, nor us, nor anybody else. Um, and as a consequence, uh, we have to fix that transaction. So it can get quite complicated when you go through these tax audits. This is why it's really, really important to really verify everything um, and make sure you've got, again, a compliance procedure in place, people in-house or outsourced that are verifying all of the top counts. Now, another thing I want to highlight, which also affects your FAPIAO accounting, is fraud schemes that can arise from FAPIAOs. So I've used the example of common expense expense claims and what employees can do without you even realizing it. Again, why you need to have a compliance system in place. Fake FAPIAOs. So like I said earlier, there's a black market for FAPIAOs. We want to make sure that all FAPIAOs are authentic and are valid. Um, and you can simply do this because FAPIAOs have um, a, a, uh, a number. Each sheet has a number associated with it. And you can put it into the system um, and, um, and analyze whether they are real or not. Is this time consuming? Absolutely. It is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. But for new employees, and especially for foreign employees that are new in China who might not know all of these things or might not be able to detect fake FAPIAOs one from another, it's really important to go through this compliance process to make sure that they are aware that they're receiving fake FAPIAOs and just give them notification. With one client, when they hired three Westerners and um, housing was part of their allowances, so they had to give uh, FAPIAOs from their landlords to the company, um, two out of the three had been given fake FAPIAOs from their landlords, okay? Which can affect your company. Yes, there's an issue with the landlord, but it still has a repercussion on you, which is why it's important to check and validate them. 
The other is different expenses by nature and substituting FOB caps for that. So to give you an example, um, and this is where, again, you have to have compliance procedures in place. Um, you travel in China by, by public bus or you travel in China by metro, you won't get a FOB cap. You have a card, you have to fill it up with money. Um, when you do a lump sum fill up, you might get a FAPIA, but all of those metro trips might not be associated with the company. Many of them might be per impersonal in nature, right? Which means that it's very difficult to give your travel costs to the company when you're taking metros and buses. So you can have a company policy saying you're not allowed to take buses and metros, so you have to take um, taxis. But I will say this, if my staff wanna speed up their trip to go to a tax bureau, they might even sit on the back of a motorcyclist to get there faster, okay? That costs two, year, two RMB. They're not gonna get a FAPIAO from the motorcyclists, okay? But I get why they're doing it. They're trying to make their business life more efficient. So you can say that for that, they, there's an ethical and moral obligation to tell the truth. Um, and they have to then substitute that fee with another type of FAPIAO, okay? Now, all of this is feasible. It's just whether you as a company are okay with this. And then it also comes down to how you're gonna record it in your books, okay? In what nature are you gonna record these types of problems? Then you've got staff who will inflate their expenses, meaning they will ask restaurants to give them FAPIAs worth, I don't know, 500 RMB when actually the meal only costs 100 RMB. You might have employees who cancel expenses, meaning it didn't, it never actually occurred, but they have a FAPIAO anyway. They might have a dinner where the dinner is split, right? There's an expense that's split into two, but they give you the FAPIAO for the full amount. Um, and so you're reimbursing the full amount instead of the split amount. <clears throat> they might make up um, business related expenses and again substitute those FAPIAOs. Or they'll have expenses that have not been self initiated, meaning it wasn't them who organized it, others did, but they're taking those FAPIAOs themselves to, to declare it. So, again, this whole FAPIAO compliance and management system also comes into corporate governance and having company policies in place in terms of what type of business expenses exist what is permitted, what is the allowance for these types of business expenses, and having a line manager verify it. Now, a line manager might not have the time to verify the FAPIAs themselves, but this is where your accountant or your outsourced accountant should validate the authenticity of these FAPIAs. And again, this all affects, when you've got this corporate governance procedure in place and these company policies in place, obviously your accountant has to be aware of them that they can also verify it. And they know how to book things within the accounting system. Now to end today's presentation on what is FAPIAO accounting. FAPIAOs are critical to the day-to-day -day business and running of your business. It affects how your financial management reports are produced. It affects whether you realize you're reading Chinese accounting standard books or whether you're reading accrual accounting standard books. I have had the experience of reviewing companies' accounts where, uh, in this scenario, the UK requested accrued accounts. The Chinese accountant, in-house account, could not properly explain what I call FAPIAO accounting, which is the Chinese accounting standard system. So they did a mixture of accrued accounts and FAPIAO accounting, which made the books a complete mess. Okay, that dialogue and that communication is so vital between the accountant and the CFO on the other end who is reviewing those accounts. So as a tip to conclude today, understand what are FAPIAOs, understand how the FAPIAO system works, decide how you are going to create your accounting system, FAPIAO accounting, accrual accounting, Make sure you've got an open dialogue with your tax officer to understand what status you have agreed on. Are you a small scale taxpayer? Are you a general VAT taxpayer? Understand what type of FAPIAOs you're issuing. It, issuing. Is it special VAT FAPIAOs, which will anyway be for general VAT taxpayers? 
or is it general VAT FOP house for small scale taxpayers? Do simulations to know what would be the best category to go into when you're starting up in China. A lot of people are scared to have open dialogue with tax officers because they feel like by um, being discreet and hiding, they can get away with stuff. You're not going to get away with anything. Have open dialogue about how your business is running, what type of transactions you're doing. Um, and I can tell you in 2023, at least in Shanghai, there has been a huge um, readjustment of tax officers. Since January, we've changed our tax officers twice, uh, meaning we're on our third one, just in three months. And we're also finding that as there's a change in tax officer, they are becoming more rigid in regards to reading agreements, contracts, going through invoices, um, and they're just, they're, they're just making the whole process a lot more bureaucratic than it was in the previous three, four years, where I think because of COVID, lockdowns, um, business world not really functioning very well in China, they were more lenient and just kind of bypassing stuff. Now it's really going into the nitty gritty details. So again, agreements, invoices, performer invoices, FOP house that are being issued, you have to have a compliance procedure in, in your operation, okay? And be open with your tax officer about the types of transactions you're doing. Um, be precise also regarding data and information on those FOP house and invoices, making sure they're accurate, correct, um, but listen at the same time, be understanding human error exists when you are trying to type out um, and print out all of these FOP counts. Uh, that is the end of today's presentation. Um, I know that this topic is very complicated. It's actually very complicated for me to present it. Um, so I hope you are able to, to understand it. If not, this is your time for questions. So type them away in the chat box um, for those of you that are watching here live, if you do have any questions. I would also to love to hear what your biggest takeaway from today was. Um, for those that arrived late, you might have jumped in at a very critical time. That might be a bit complicated because you missed the introduction part. We have recorded today's session, so you can also look back at the recording to watch the intro part, which might help you to understand the latter part of the presentation. Um, but do let me know what your biggest takeaway from, away from today was. And if you've got any questions, let me know. Um, we will have a Q&A. If you are struggling to understand Fa Piao's and how it can impact your China business, let us know. Um, we can set up a free 15 minute discovery call to see if we actually can help you or at least educate you in those 15 minutes um, uh, in regards to your own business and your own experiences with Fop House and, and the pain points that you might be experiencing. Um, you will get a copy of all of this and I will be providing the link in the email that will follow once I've got the recording available so you can set up a call through that, through that um, email. And I wanna thank everyone for joining our Thrive in China Roundtable. Um, our next session, the next two Wednesdays, we're off for the Easter break, uh, but our next session is on the 19th of April, where we're gonna look at how to calculate your registered capital for your China business. This will go through what is registered capital, how should you be calculating it, um, how does it impact your startup phase? And what is the uh, uh, injection time for that capital? Uh, I know for a lot of CFOs abroad, this is always a big topic. Um, so we'll be going through that as, um, as well on the 19th of April. So stay tuned um, and definitely, I hope to see you all there. Uh, for those of you that have questions, nothing has popped in, but, um, oh, James, you've got a question. Hold on, let me unmute you. You, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, no, no, sorry, no questions. Thank you. I just wanted oh. to say thank you. Oh, no problem. Thank you, James. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, take care, everyone, um, and have a great afternoon. Bye.